My name is Robert Kibaya, and I'm um, TechSoup uh, Global uh, Connect Uganda chapter. And uh, we usually organize meetups. Uh, we call them uh, tech meetups, social good. And uh, we usually meet uh, on a weekly basis, uh, whereby a member who has a skill it comes in to share with other members uh, free of charge. So we don't charge uh, for our events. And uh, everyone is actually free like to become host for a program in his or our country. And you just have to get in contact with the uh, TechSoup Connect uh, Global Coordinator, Eli. Uh, is not here with us because right now it is in this country it is at 4 a.m so maybe you would have to uh, find a recorded the session uh, allow me just uh, one minute uh, as Karen is setting up a presentation you can set up then we begin as I talk to Ronald our second presenter is trying to call yeah please go on Colin so the technology is giving everybody trouble today and that's what we're talking about we're talking about implementing a sustainable e-learning program in Africa and for me this is something that's really close to my heart in terms of how do we really get everybody access to e-learning how do we get people to be empowered by e-learning so I've put together some thoughts. They're not necessarily the only thoughts, but it's one view. And I would love your comments and things in the chat. So what do we need to effectively implement a sustainable e-learning program in Africa? Let's explore. So me and Spirokova and Hamilton wrote this paper in 2019, and they spoke about sustainability requirements for e-learning systems. And I've taken their academic paper and I've elaborated on it, I've adapted it slightly, and I've looked at that in terms of our context within Africa. But what they spoke about was they first of all said to have a sustainable program, we need economic stability. So we need positive economic value and capital, and that needs to be insured and it needs to be preserved. The next point they said is we need to be environmentally sustainable. So the program needs to think about the natural resources that are protected from human needs and human wastes, which is a huge thing, not just in Africa, but globally. The third aspect was the technical sustainability in terms of the technology coping with changes. And we know technology is evolving and changing so very quickly. So looking at how is it changing in a fair manner, respecting the natural environments. And I think that's really important. The fourth one was social sustainability, the relationships, looking at society. So equal uh, equity across different peoples, diversity, connectedness, and democracy in terms of individual views and not just looking at countries or at the relationships within countries. Um, aspect they looked at was human sustainability. So is the individual protected, supported with dignity, improving the quality of life and no threaten, threatening of people? And if we think of our continent, these are all issues in lots of different spaces. And then I added this if we wanted to be sustainable. Each of us as individuals need to think about our own role in terms of an e-learning system and it being sustainable. So how are we committed to that system? And how are we being responsible digital citizens so that we are digitally sustainable? So let's explore this further. So what is e-learning? E-learning is classroom spaces, whether it's face-to-face -face and the children are on laptops or tablets and the um, learners could be at a distance, but within a digital learning space. So they're using digital for their learning, the E being electronic. What is blended learning? Well, blended learning is an aspect of e-learning. So it could be in a classroom face-to-face, -face, 
it could be in a blended learning space, could be with or without technology. So if we're talking from an e-learning space, it would be with the technology. And your blended learning could then have aspects of online learning, which don't necessarily have to be taking place in the classroom. They could be online and not in the same space as the teacher. And so blended learning is this mixture of where the teacher is sometimes seeing her children and sometimes not seeing the children. So what is remote learning? Remote learning is where it is digital completely in this instance from an e-learning point of view. And the teacher is online and the learners and children are online, but they're not in the same space. So they're not on the same school grounds. They're not in the same classroom. One will be in a different space to another. So now if we look at each of these aspects, if we look at technical sustainability, where it's talking about technology must cope with changes and evolve in a fair manner respecting natural resources, the most important aspect in terms of our continent and in terms of an e-learning platform really working is internet connectivity. And we know that that's a problem across our continent. So how do we improve that connectivity? How do we have people have access to data? The other thing is looking at the different kinds of technologies we want to include on this platform. What are we going to consider and how will that impact the technical aspect? So what about artificial intelligence, including 3D printing, where they could be sending files to a station and have them printed and maybe the objects then sent back to students or teachers? What about adding robotics in a similar way where they're working with robots, perhaps building and learning about robotics and 3D printing on these platforms, or perhaps activating robots, but from a distance? Virtual reality, something I really love. How do we include that? Would it be something to include on the e-learning platform? What about augmented reality and how you could be getting the learning from that point of view? Do we include things like the Internet of Things? Or what kind of devices is this platform going to cope with? Is it just going to be for tablets or is it going to be for computers and tablets? Are we even going to consider having a mobile friendly kind of space? So all of these things need to be considered. But on top of that, there are all these other technologies that have been developed over the last few years. And what we really need to think about in terms of what we want to put on the platform and how do we look at it from a technical point of view is taking and thinking about responsible choices. What are the things that are most going to suit the people who are going to get it? What are we going to be upskilling them for? How are we making them aware of these new kinds of changes in terms of e-learning? And what kind of courses do you put on the platform to really upskill people to become self-empowered. So we then need to also think about what is the infrastructure that's needed for this platform? Well, most old systems use in-house server type infrastructures, but today we've got cloud-based learning and cloud-based access from a range of different providers. We would need to think about which type of platform would you use? And when we're using that, the advantages of a web-based or cloud-based platform is that it's really easy to access. It's much more cost effective because you don't have to worry about um, extra security and protections and not getting data installed and up, up um, forgotten the words, up uh, making your services uh, or, the, or the centers or the computers more reliable by upgrading them and getting them to be more effective coping with the newer threats in terms of security. So a cloud-based system generally protects you from a lot of that. So that makes much more sense and it's much less hassles in terms of running an online platform. We then need to think about what devices should we consider in this space? Are we going to use it so that teachers can use it on data projectors or interactive whiteboard type scenarios? Or are they going to be using just laptops in a space? Are we going to think about tablets or iPads? What about the students' mobile devices? Is the platform going to work on something like that? Or 3D printers? Or looking at things like Raspberry Pis or Arduinos, how are they going to be included? Or what about robotics and coding? 
thinking about if you're having devices and they belong to a center or a space, storage and charging needs to be considered. What about teaching students about drones and other types of technology? So all of this needs to be considered. And then on top of that, you need to think about what type of learning environment is this going to be streamed to? And what kind of access do the people who are going to be using the platform going to be using? Is it going to be where everybody's just going to bring their own devices? Are there going to be spaces where a presenter or somebody could go and uh, hire or fetch a shared cart and then take it to a center where people can share it? Or are there going to be libraries or places where students can actually go and hire out a device to do the courses? All of that needs to be considered. But if you're talking online, data is still the most important thing. How do we make sure that the students or the people wanting to use the platform have access to it because they have data? So how do we make sure they're connected and can stay up to date? The first thing we should do is we need to conduct an audit. We need to make sure what is already in that space and how this platform is going to be used. So what devices are going to be used and by whom? What infrastructure is going to be used? What staffing requirements are going to be needed to run the platform? And will there be offerings of professional development to teach people how to use the courses or to develop materials for the platform? Will you need a physical space? Will you be looking at rooms or um, changing buildings or building a new building? Do you need to upgrade facilities such as electrical or water facilities? Are there policies in place in terms of the platform, the device usage or access to the platform? What about digital security on the platform that people's data is protected? So developing an implementation plan is really, really important when thinking about this online platform. And then you need to think about the budget. It's not gonna come just from people giving their own time. So you need to consider what is a successful implementation? the infrastructure, the devices, the productivity suites that are gonna be used or the management systems that are gonna be provided, what training is gonna be provided for the developers, for the people who are going to be using the courses, all of those things need to be considered. And you need to think about what are the budget restraints that you need to put in place. So planning carefully is really, really important. If we then look at economic stability, so looking at a positive economic value and capital in terms of this platform so that it is insured and preserved, we need to think about how do we create access. So if we think about technology, every part of our lives is impacted by technology. And then if we think about Africa and we think about the growth of educational technology and think about how this platform could really be used to empower people even more. Think about the lack that we have in, in our continent in terms of um, resources available because of language diversity, because of cultural diversity, and just because of localization. So if a platform like this could be created that could address all of those needs, that would be incredible. So if we look at the global education technology market in 2020, it was $89 billion. That's a huge amount of money. And if we just look at some of the African startups, there are a large number that range from education for tiny little children all the way up into higher education. There are whole groups of education systems that might want to belong to a system like this. There might be individual courses or projects or products that people sell that would enhance this kind of program. So think about including those within the space. So if we're thinking about it moving on from an environmental point of view, we're now looking at natural resources protected from human needs and wastes. So if we start off by our big global tech providers, for example, Google is really trying to make all their data centers to be environmentally friendly from the way they operate to the way they work. If you hop onto Google data centers, it's a fantastic website to go and look to. They created with UNESCO and a couple of other organizations, this Go Carbon Free 24 seven. 
And so there's this whole movement by these big tech companies to say, how do we become carbon free? Google has a range of different kinds of offerings and scenarios and suggestions on their carbon free website. So saying, how do we get rid of electronic devices responsibly? Or how do we re reduce city transport? Then if we look at IBM, they've just put out a note saying that they're committing to a net zero greenhouse of gas emissions by 2030. And Amazon too has their data centers and offerings where they're looking at being sustainable and responsible. So we need to think about who are we partnering with? What are the companies we are joining? And are they meeting this environmental sustainability role in terms of the e-learning platform? But then when we think about the platform itself, we need to think about, so are we teaching sustainability on this e-learning platform? And so that it can be implemented in schools or in communities. So for example, water conservation and monitoring could be a course that could be done. And students could be building the electronic co components and that could be linked to taps that are dripping or bathroom areas so that students are aware of water that's been wasted as well as teachers and the rest of the community. What about energy conservation and monitoring? And if you look at the picture in the bottom with the graph with the blue and the red and the yellow flags, that's in a school in South Africa where the children can actually go and see as well as the teachers how much electricity is being used and monitored in the school building at that particular time live. Imagine having that everywhere in all the different schools to create an awareness. What about waste management and waste reduction? What about recycling and reusing projects and products that could be online? What about vegetable gardens with digital tracking and watering monitoring systems? What about aquaponics or bird life tracking, making students aware of the nature around them in their communities and their schools? Or what about plants and tree life? So we can make projects really practical and still be teaching them about the environment and how to be respectful at the same time learning about new technologies. Another kind of aspect that we should look at is the social sustainability. So the relationships within a society, is it equitable, is it diverse, is it connected and is it democratic? And when we're creating this platform, we need to consider that in terms of how we're creating it. So we need to think about who is going to be using the platform. So when we create it, is it respecting, is it respecting the different religions and cultures and beliefs of other people? Are we seeing each other being able to teach and learn from each other as individuals, seeing each learner as a separate individual? Are we treating everyone fairly and respectfully on the platform? And are we setting an example as teachers in terms of how we're engaging with our students or community leaders so that everybody feels comfortable and the platform creates a space for that? If we then look at sustainability, in terms of social dynamics. There are so many different cultural beliefs and there are so many prejudices that exist within society. So how are we, when we're developing the platform, looking at being aware of our own unconscious bias? Is everybody welcome within the platform? No matter their gender type, are we considering how we are coping with accessibility and people with needs? How are we making the platform accessible so that young girls can even go during the um, period months and can't actually attend school, but could still be attending an online session? How are we making these kinds of scenarios accessible for everybody? Thinking about every individual's needs and not stepping on people's toes. When we think about this, and we're developing a platform, we need to talk to as many different people as possible. So the platform says it will involve everybody and everybody is then seen as valued. So building a community to put the platform together and thinking about it, whoever the community is, you need to get everybody on board, whether it's government education departments or educational leaders or the educators themselves, we need to think about how we can get the inputs so that the platform suits them really well. Think about the governing bodies of school organizations to support them, or maybe their unions or other areas of people. 
the parents and the school community should be informed. The whole community should know about the platform and have input in terms of what they think will really benefit their community. And definitely the children from younger ages to older ages should be asked their opinion in terms of what would be needed for this platform. So that a real e-learning sustainability platform can be created for a whole community. We then need to think about human sustainability. Think about the individual protected and supported with dignity to improve the quality of life and not threatened. In Africa, people are threatened often and we feel vulnerable. So how do we create a space which we know is securely protected, where individuals data and information is protected on that space, where we'll be monitoring things like bullying and cyber bullying, so that people who are not behaving appropriately would be flagged and perhaps there are courses that they could go on to actually help them to treat people nicely before they are asked to be removed. How do we actually think about changing mindsets within the space? So thinking about civil society in this digital age and how we protect people's data. If we then continue thinking about the human sustainability, because it's people who are going to be using this platform, we need to think about our personal uh, protection in terms of the data and how that's going to be protected on the platform. And then you need to think about what are the other tools that are going to be included? For example, resources so that accessibility tools will be able to be linked in and people who are blind or deaf would also be able to use the platform. If we then think about young people and how we need to consider changes, young people are often considered as screen agers because they're always on screens. They have a digital footprint. They are seen as digital natives. They demand access. They see it as a right and not as something which they should just have time to do. They are often seen as social gurus and really comfortable on social media. So we need to think about how we consider that within our spaces. So understanding the benefits of e-learning for learners is really important. That our children and learners are changing and use technology, that everyone should be engaged and interacting on their devices. And so how does this platform engage with that? Encouraging collaboration and interactivity, being relevant and authentic and real world is really important for a platform like this. Individualized and personalized learning that you can create your own learning pathway that suits your needs and interests would also be really relevant. So there are lots of positive reasons for having a platform like this. And then if we think about the educators who might be developing the content or using the content, if we look at this platform, this box at the bottom is a teacher who is teacher centered and doesn't really use technology. And if we look across, you've got Bloom's taxonomy growing across. So the type of questioning they would ask would be knowledge and recall type questions. In the block above D, this person is using some technology, they, but they are still only asking the lower order thinking questions and using direct instruction. Whereas the teacher who is in B might still be looking at a teacher-centered approach with little or no use of technology, but they are getting the children to think and they are getting them to use higher order thinking and their lessons are probably more constructivist than they are direct instruction. But the teachers that we really want them to get to is a teacher who can use a range of questioning from knowledge and recall right the way up to higher order thinking and is using technology in a really wonderful way of reflection and collaboration. And so you would want your teachers to be skilled enough to get into level C. So you need upskilling to do that within the teachers. So the teachers become comfortable with technology and will encourage children to use this e-learning platform, will themselves perhaps begin to develop courses to put onto the platform and that they will see it as a benefit and not as a threat. And so professional development is vital within the space to make it sustainable for this e-learning program. Whatever courses you decide and however you wanna teach the teachers is really, really, not important. What is important is that teachers begin to use technology and feel comfortable with using the technology. 
We need educators and teachers to realize the benefits of using e-learning because children are changing and the, they use technology and so the lessons should as well. That they should be collaborating with their learners really easily using the technology. Saving time, for example, using auto marking tools, using the data for personalized le learning. Instant feedback is just the best thing ever and getting to know where your learners are at and that the learners know where they're at as well. Reducing your admin load when you begin to use technology is also really relevant. There are a wide range of content opportunities that you could be using on this type of platform to get teachers and students really engaged. And we're preparing the learners really for the future. So taking away the fear of teachers, getting them not to use technology, and not to fear technology, but to use it. The greater fear is if our teachers don't use technology at all and children are not exposed. So this type of platform is really relevant. And again, there are lots of positive reasons. And so the last aspect is looking at us as individuals. What is my role in terms of an e-learning platform? That I keep learning both technology and pedagogy, that I stay up to date, that the teaching strategies and methodologies are used are relevant and the technologies are relevant. That we learn about internet safety, keeping ourselves safe and the people which we are working with. That we think about sustainability and the long-term use of the devices. That we think about how we're going to dispose of the devices responsibly. That we think about our social footprint and are we posting socially responsibly? If somebody Googles our name, what comes up? And then are we teaching responsibly in terms of the social media and the apps that we're using and the technologies we're using? So as individuals, we should all take that responsibility. We're the parents, we're the teachers, we're the part of the community. If somebody Googles your name, what comes up? And so we need to say, we need to ask ourselves, what is my digital footprint? How do people see me digitally? And am I being a responsible digital citizen? So we need to make the shift to complete the technology integration, have access on this platform to all sorts of subjects, as many as possible, that there's active engagement in a platform like this, that there's a blended learning opportunity for those perhaps who need to download content and work on it and those that can work online and get immediate feedback that you could even be using this platform for flipped classroom scenarios that you could be um, getting children to research stuff on the platform and then go and discuss it in a real classroom space that there's problem-based learning where we're getting children to think and solve problems and not just giving them the answers and that we're really inspiring creativity with this platform and so if we're investing in the future and we are saying that we need to consider all of these roles, we need to upskill our teachers, but we also need to make this platform really inspiring and exciting so that children want to attend it and want to go onto it and learn on it. So how do we, or why do we need to do this? Well, if we look at this UNICEF result from last year, and we look at just the African result. How many children are not connected within Africa is really, really scary. And so going back to my very first comment where we need connectivity and we need data access is exceptionally important. But our children need this kind of access and our continent needs this kind of platform and access and our world needs it because they talk about Africa being the next stepping stone. And so we, who, the continent who has the largest number of young people should create, be creating a platform that is really inspiring our children. So how do we do this? We do this one step at a time where we can implement e-learning to empower our children, where we can build knowledge, we can prepare them for the future and we can truly create a sustainable e-learning program. I hope this was useful and one snippet or one angle of view but thank you to everyone for your time yes uh, thank you karen uh, for this wonderful presentation and for all that information
I actually I was so interested in the platform. And then the point where you mentioned that when you're uh, actually thinking of a platform, then you need to consult with the different stakeholders and uh, who are going actually to be interacting with that platform. I think that's the learners and then the parents, uh, policy makers. Yeah, uh, maybe for your information for uh, this lockdown, actually parents faced a challenge where uh, schools, we are coming up with a number of strategies on how to keep the learners uh, uh, busy during the lockdown. So whatever that we are trying on, again, it was not working out as parents thought it would be. Like Zoom, others they found themselves like even they don't now manage Zoom, <laughs> parents themselves, even the school administrators themselves. So really it was a, a very big problem. And uh, we organized this event, I, I think we shall have another session. Uh, like uh, we, we need to have the policy makers, like where I live, I contacted the people in charge of education in my district. Uh, I, I think they are connected somewhere because I talk to them and say, oh, I can listen to her. Uh, I, I need to figure, out, figure it out with the tech soup. Uh, how they, they connect these platforms. It seems that we are logging in here, but other people again, they are able to listen to us on different platforms. So we should have a number of them joining in, uh, like uh, to get all this kind of information. Because seriously, we don't have uh, a strategy for e-learning, especially. Uh, for the primary school and the secondary school, like here in Uganda. And uh, even government itself, it was uh, trying its level best. They tried the television. It didn't work out because there are questions. What about those in the villages who don't have electricity? Yeah. And then they, 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 they tried the, the radio. Again, how, could, how can you manage a class on a radio station with the, maybe those kids like below five years or just beginning their education. And also if like their parents are not uh, themselves literate, so there are big challenges. But then we looked at yeah, how is it done with other countries like uh, South Africa, you can see some uh, children, we are actually continuing with the, uh, the education. Uh, like here in Uganda, uh, a friend came from US with the, his kid and he was learning on a computer. They have those special yes. computers which they use and he yeah. was continuing, yes. Uh, so I think- And like, not even when, when... special computers, it's just connected to the internet. So things like Google mm. Classroom, Microsoft Teams, um, yeah. Those are really quick and easy, but the same challenges you're describing in Uganda, we had exactly the same challenges here in mm. South Africa, where mm. parents and teachers were very frustrated, um, didn't know technology, the schools that could do it were the schools that had implemented technology, schools which yeah. hadn't implemented technology, which is the vast majority of schools here had huge mm. trouble and the same we saw here where teachers were desperate. Principals were pulling their hair out. It was so frustrating and sad to see. Yeah, so those are, uh, yeah, we, we shall have more discussion on that. And uh, our leaders are able to listen like uh, our local leaders. So we can come up with a, a better strategy on how like uh, we can implement uh, a sustainable learning program for the children. Uh, maybe other participants, if you have a question, you have an issue to bring to 
attention of Karen, then you are free, please. I don't know if we have Lona dear, uh, our, our next presenter. Yes, please, I'm available, I, I'm very sorry. I, I know, I, we are sorry or other participants, but uh, you see TechSoup, there are so much in technology. So I don't know how they link like, do you have different Zoom platforms? But like we are logging in here and other participants are scattered in other uh, rooms and they are listening, but they are not able to come to this main session. Yeah. So you are most welcome. Uh, maybe we have this. If you have a question or issue to raise to Karen, please do it. And then we can have Leonard. Uh, we just have to extend some time. I'll explain to TechSoup because we are the first challenge. Yeah. Uh, he has again vanished. Eh? Uh, yeah. So, uh, Karen, uh, for the platform bit of it, uh, like if you, you, are, you lived in Africa, you know uh, most of the challenges we have here. Uh, which kind of platform, or like if you are designing a platform for e learning for our children, what do you think we have to focus at? I think. I think we first need to think about what is the scale? So is this platform gonna be for a whole sort of country's um, kind of space or are you saying it's going to be a whole African one? Because I think the first thing you need to think about is how many people are going to use it. So if you use something like Microsoft Teams or a Google Classroom, the scale can't cope with millions and millions and millions of people. So first of all, you need to think about where, where are you wanting to end up? And then you mm. need to think about, so who is this for? Is it for, like you said, primary school children? But in South Africa, we've got lots of children that fall off the bus. We've got lots of children that are not in school. So for me, it's like, how do we reach those children as well? And is this mm. platform mm. going to help children who just can't get to school? So therefore, I think, something like a mobile friendly is really important so that it can work mm. on a phone. And I heard of a platform the other day, which is even um, smart, a phone friendly, but not smartphones. So the version before smartphones, that there's a platform that will work on something like that. Now imagine if mm. you had apps and things that could work on those really entry level kind of phones as well. So you can really get to the poorest of the communities. Because if we mm. look in South Africa, I don't know about the rest of Africa, but in South Africa, we actually have mm. more phone contracts than we have people. So mm. there are phones, but the, mm. who, the grandmother who lives in the very rural areas who is looking after the children, she gets mm. the hand-me-downs. So she's got the phone that's two or three generations old. So the platform mm. needs to be able to cope with that kind of phone so that the children she's looking after would be able to do that. And then I really think it's governments talking across the continent to network providers to see how mm. we can get the price of data down. I saw an mm. interesting study the other day which Google presented called TARA, it's T-A-A-R-A, -A -A, and they're mm. testing it in Uganda. But that is taking data and sharing data using light. So they looking at it across like river gorges and things like that to get access to very rural areas. But imagine if our data could be spread like that. The cost reduction is just ridiculously low and you'll be able to have greater access. So getting things like that right, TV white space, that they keep saying they're going to make available. So really as communities, we should be putting pressure on governments and, com and community leaders to say, how are you giving access to everybody so that costs are reduced so that people can have access? Uh, hi everybody, my name is, uh, I'm from Mali, West Africa. Uh, I, I, I would like just to make uh, a comment about uh, the point uh, that here uh, first, to, to share Malian experience because uh, during the lockdown period, 
or we as everybody in the world face some challenges about the education school were uh, closed. And, and the government tried two strategies. First, they tried to, because uh, most of the population here have not access to internet uh, or some uh, internet services. So they tried to make a program on television, but there are even some region here where, where there are no television. So they have no access even the television. They have all, all, all the only radio uh, to, to show this kind of course. So they, this were many challenges facing to this situation. And the second thing they tried is, this is for the higher level, for the university level, to release some data free for students. Uh, uh, so the professor can just send the lesson to WhatsApp group or uh, something like this. And even for that, it was very, uh, the data, the amount of data they released were not sufficient for this kind of, because most of the time they contain videos and uh, uh, many lectures which are very heavy and it, it demands uh, a lot of data. So I think, uh, and the third and last one is about the language challenge, because as you said, it is important to discuss about uh, uh, implementing a platform is good, but you know, here in the western part of Africa, most of the, 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 the countries are French speaking countries. So, if we, we want to make a sustainable and efficient uh, platform, we should think at the beginning about the languages. How many languages are we uh, including in this uh, platform? Uh, local languages, international languages, and try to find to see which languages are uh, most spoken in, in, in different regions of Africa. This is some comment I wanted to make, and I'm, I'm, I'm willing to help. I'm, I'm very concerned about education. I'm a medical doctor. I'm, I'm also at the university training. I finished uh, my general practitioner degree. Now I'm, I'm starting, I started to specialize and I experienced many e-learning platform uh, taking course to, uh, from different universities around the world and it was really helpful. So um, I'm, I'm very concerned and I know it could be very helpful, helpful if it is very well done. Thank you. Thank you for your comment and uh, I, I don't know if Karen, you have any reaction to us that. I think those comments are all really valid. Um, so what I would even say is you saying find the languages, but if it was a scalable platform, we could even use a platform like that to preserve languages. So I know that what's happening here in South Africa is that some of the languages are almost dying because people's children don't speak those languages anymore or they they don't speak them enough. And so there are fewer and fewer people. And I think it's something that's happening to lots of small communities um, across Africa. And so you could even say a platform like that in the long term could, where small groups of people could develop courses for their language and those languages then can be preserved could be another way of looking at it as well. So that's why I'm thinking a platform like this should be something that could easily scale and be really diverse in nature. So it should be easily adaptable, easy to use, um, and can be customizable even by country or by district, perhaps. Okay, I have a, a, a quick and few, uh, quick question. Is, is, is there any possibility to, to make a platform uh, less, less uh, taking data? Because I think, uh, uh, we, we at the first time beginning to do some meeting with Zoom and they try to implement some other platform which take less data. So uh, this, is this possible? So yes, there are platforms that use less data. So yes, it's possible. <clears throat> For example, Google Meet compared to Zoom and some of the other platforms actually uses less data. And if you use it on your phone, it recognizes that you're on your phone and it uses even less data. So if you connected to this call via, if it was a Google Meet call and you connected via your phone rather than a, a, a computer, um, it uses less data. So 
a video call, you can get platforms. But for me, an e-learning platform isn't just video calling. For me, an e-learning platform could be self-paced courses, and, and you could almost have an option of whether there are videos or whether there are no videos. And so that would impact the amount of data. Um, on some courses, what you can do is you can download the videos um, and maybe it's linking with something like YouTube Go. So YouTube Go is a African, was, was developed for Africa. And what happens there is if you like, if there are videos that you like on YouTube, you can download them on YouTube Go and they cached on your phone. And what happens then with the caching is that after two or three weeks, they um, get taken off again. So if you've got enough space on your phone, you're not going to use data every time you want to watch it. And so maybe it's finding features like that. I believe mm. Overdrive, which is a really big book, a global library space, which works with communities and governments and public libraries because they believe individuals should get free books. They have a similar system. So if, if your community library is an Overdrive um, provider, you use the app, you go in and you get whatever books that you want. It's cached on your cell phone on the app. And after two weeks, the books automatically pulled off um, and as, as if it's handed in. If you haven't finished reading, well, bad luck. So I'm sure if this technology is there, we could find it to use on digital platforms. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Yeah, I think we, we are coming to the end of this. Uh, we are sorry, Ronald, uh, maybe as a challenge with the internet. Uh, so, yeah, he had sent in his presentation. Maybe we shall share with everyone on the group uh, because uh, we are like 20 minutes past uh, the, the time which we had uh, proposed to have this session. Uh, but uh, we are so grateful, Karen, for uh, the presentation, and uh, we are going to continue to engage with you, uh, especially with the, uh, my district here in Uganda. Uh, I already talked to, to the governor and those people in the education system, uh, because as a member of uh, the COVID-19 task force in my district, uh, the number of challenges we actually faced with the education system, how to make children continue with the schools. Uh, right now, we face a big challenge with the pregnancies uh, because children, we are not uh, doing anything at home. And uh, so we propose that we have to have a strategy uh, because we have not to wait for uh, another pandemic, uh, but uh, this has opened our eyes and uh, we have to think on how we actually can have uh, a sustainable e-learning program, which can actually accommodate uh, most of the learners. So we just have to think around that and then we have to work with professions like you uh, just to make sure that uh, we do things right because I'm also a parent and uh, we, we have been paying uh, money to schools. Uh, so we have now Zoom, connecting Zoom is not working. Uh, connecting is not working. And uh, then Ronald, is back actually, Ronaldin and the, his friends, their company, they have helped us a lot, like Karen, what you've mentioned, those downloadable videos, they are producing a number of that and then sharing with the parents. And uh, when I looked at that, then I saw, uh, this is something which can really work uh, for, most of the parents and the, being a young company, then we have to figure it out, like how it can work with the external 
partners, and then we have these technologies uh, worked on well, and we have a well-laid program which can help us all. Yeah. Uh, so, Leonard, welcome back, um, but uh, we are really closing. Maybe we can, you can just talk to us like maybe five to 10 minutes. Uh, you summarize your presentation, uh, then we, we, we close this. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much, Robert. Once again, I apologize, but uh, the network issues are the ones disturbing me, and it, I'm in the middle of the town. Uh, I've missed most of the presentation uh, that uh, I'm really sorry about that. But my task was to present uh, on the, the challenges, the, first of all, the advantages uh, uh, of e-learning and then the challenges that we are facing. Uh, um, from DT Points e-learning center, uh, one of the young uh, e-learning platform that we just formed in, uh, last year in July, to see how a professional teacher of physics and mathematics, together with my colleague, who is a computer scientist and who is also teaching computer skills, we came up with this platform to see how we can engage our learners while they are at home. And that's how we came in with DT Points e-learning center. Uh, uh, we, we, we have talked, of course, there are two types of e-learning. Is one of real time like the one we have, but for us we had opted for the one which is not real time, where we do record the lessons and send. Uh, they can download. Uh, that was to address the challenges of uh, real time e-learning platforms like Zoom when the network is very unstable and somebody has to get off unceremoniously like a video. So. That was the main thing, to see that we can address some of the challenges of e-learning uh, or network. We actually, we thought we would even opt to be offline, but still remain on e-learning, whereby we would ban uh, our content on the CD and deliver or a parent would come to our office and pick, such that there is no any challenge of network uh, that is encountered. And uh, at first, uh, it was working out uh, uh, before the second lockdown, which started in, Ju in June, uh, whereby there was no any movement. That was because for you to come to the office and pick material through a flash or a CD, you can support yourself and come to the office. But now with the second lockdown, there was that challenge of movement, and we had now to, to provide links uh, to send to the parents such that they can be able to download the content. Now, uh, about the, the, the advantages, uh, our dear listeners and viewers, uh, there are many, but I just sorted out uh, five. I sent you, Robert, my summary. Uh, I, I don't know if I'll be able to show this, but uh, e-learning, learning can take anywhere. That is uh, one of the advantages. You can be home at any geographical place for as long as there is network or you have the content in an electronic form. You can learn from anywhere. Then e-learning can also be that is repetitive. You can miss out something, but you go and read, uh, watch the video, watch the lesson, and this can improve your retention or understanding, unlike where you will be able to miss if you went to a physical class. If you cannot attend, then you have missed out a lesson. But here you keep repeating. Now. Uh, e-learning is actually very cheap. It, uh, it makes the learning very cheap as opposed to, to the physical. Uh, for example, as Robert you were, we were sending the content free, but that would be that our material is good, and later we thought we would, we would sell to you cheaply. Uh, hello? Yeah, please go. Yeah. Okay, that's next. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Robert. I think I can be heard. Hmm. Okay, so uh, we were estimating for a primary uh, child who was paying around 500 uh, or about 100 uh, or 50 dollars with the e learning, and that makes it really a uh, also environmental friendly. 
if we using electronic form to learn, then we won't pollute the environment. And the environment will be will be clean uh, with the use of e-learning, work is sent, exercise is done through it. work is marked electronically, sent back, feedback is sent back, and therefore the environment will not be what? Littered and not be damaged. Uh, mm. uh, now I I classified my disadvantage here, uh, here, listeners and viewers. Now, with the disadvantage, is especially to us, the teachers and the learners, the lack of, there is lack of social interaction. The learner will be isolated in a room where he's learning from, but will not be able to interact with the uh, other children, which is also very important. Uh, E-learning becomes very hard for us to instruct whenever it is a practical lesson. I, when I go to INA, I had a presenter trying to teach us on how we can use tools. Uh, but however, the lack of computer literacy, it makes it very hard. For example, for me, a physics teacher, to try to make a lesson very practical on the e-learning platform. Much as the, when I was trying to uh, animate my videos, I tried to make sure that they are as attractive and they try to bring the picture. For example, I would, I would admit, uh, 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 for example, in a topic of waves, and I would make something which shows that a wave would travel like this. But to, to take to do that, you have to be really innovative to make the lesson appear practical. But uh, they are not very practical. Then another thing is, uh, think, how do you determine that the assignment you gave the learner is the one who did it? He was not helped. He just watched the video and was able to understand and give you a feedback. It is very hard to determine. And that is the challenge we get in the e-learning. Uh, we were able to give uh, mid-term tests to, to the learners. And uh, yes, we, we were able to mark it. But you would see someone tried, but you see someone would be helped. But that was just imaginary. So that was also a challenge. Then e-learning also tends to be very destructive. Somebody has to be very focused to, 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 to self-discipline, to, to watch the video. Otherwise, when you're online, these distractions, these days we have ads on, they pop from anywhere uh, on the computer. And uh, if the learner is not very focused, will be distracted by that and will not really concentrate on the subject matter. Uh, however, the African challenge is that I can, Robert, do I still have time? Let me yeah, bring just two or three challenges only. Because we, we overstayed on this. Thank you, event. thank you, thank you. Yeah. Now, the biggest challenge we have faced, Robert, is the challenge, the poor attitude of both the parents and the learners that they cannot learn via e-learning or via electronic material. They do not actually believe that they can watch a video, a pre-recorded video, and they understand. I have personally moved from home to home to market our content, but the, the biggest challenge I faced was the attitude. It was the attitude is so poor in our African setting as per now. The second challenge is the challenge of the lack of gadgets to be used. In mm. our, the lack of gadgets to be used like computers, when for us we're coming up with this platform, we reach everyone irrespective of the, the income class, uh, whereby if somebody can afford power and a TV would, would be able to access our, our material. But even then, we found that some homes could not even afford a TV set, whereby you can just... So the, the lack of budgets uh, in, the, in the families or the shortage of the income that they have has become a very big one challenge is the this comes both like the previous presenter said both the us the teachers the, the parents and also including what the learners uh in our setting in africa there are quite a few people who are computer literate they we can send the work even if we're sending work freely somebody fails to download because he's being challenged by the app the application of downloading what the material so unless there is serious sensitization, uh, we, can, we cannot easily have sustainable e-learning in Africa. We really need sensitization. And lastly, uh, lastly, lastly is the problem of financial resources. 
uh, mm. financial resources uh, have really limited us, even, uh, even with us ourselves in the DT points, to produce the content in the time we require and quality we want. You have to get animators, you have to train them, you have to get the teachers, you have to train them, the teachers to produce. So all that needs to, for you to have enough resources to assemble all those uh, labor resources and gadgets to produce quality work for sustainable e-learning. Uh, Robert, due to time, let me uh, stop here. Thank you very yeah, much thank you. for this time. You're welcome. Thank you, Rolad. And uh, yes, we understand the uh, internet challenges and uh, thank you yeah thank you uh thank you all the participants and uh, our presenters uh for the time and we are so very sorry uh for this long for this event supposed supposed to be one hour maybe if you have like uh, a few one two questions or to to run at please feel free and just use like three minutes, then we close. Yeah, maybe we don't have any at the moment. So thank you so much. I can see all the messages. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you uh, for the presentation. And uh, oh, uh, as I promised that uh, we are not going to leave this here uh, because it's a challenge that all of us have uh, faced. And the pandemic has actually brought in a number of other problems, especially to the learners. Uh, so we need to do really something uh, for, this, for this cause, uh, because we can't continue like this. Uh, you find that, uh, for example, here, uh, like more than two years, children at home, uh, they are so vulnerable, especially the young girls. Uh, so we need to think with the uh, policy makers and uh, we have to make things work. We need to pattern with people who have the skills and then we come up with something which can lead the other communities here, down here. So thank you so much, Karen. And uh, I'm go we are going to continue engaging you. I'll send a report to my local government and then we we'll see how we can carry on with these efforts. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, yeah. Rogers. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.